warm welcome to you all this evening, especially those who are visiting us tonight. It's a special joy to see you. Let's uh, remind ourselves about uh, who we're worshipping this evening. Hopefully something will come up on the screen, Psalm 84, that I want to read to you before we pray. Interestingly, we'll be looking at one of the Psalms of Asaph a little bit later on, and uh, his last psalm is 83, and we're looking at Psalm 84, which is a psalm of one of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. I love his name, I love his word, and that's what we're going to do. Now we're going to read from God's word. If you'd like to turn with me to... Psalm 50. I don't know about you and your experience in other churches, but I've often found that when churches begin to study the Psalms, they often get as far as the first 10 or so, and then they, they give up. And so um, discussion amongst the elders, we decided to look at a few of the later Psalms that tend to get neglected. As you know, David wasn't the only psalmist, although he wrote the vast majority. Moses, for example, wrote one psalm. Anybody know what that psalm was? Number 90, well done. Psalm 90, wonderful psalm. Solomon wrote a couple. I can't even remember myself what those are. Um, the sons of Korah are attributed uh, with writing some, although it's more likely that uh, David wrote them, and then the sons of Korah set them to music. Which proves actually you can be a good musician and theologian as well. But definitely Asaph wrote at least 10, possibly 12 psalms that make up the bulk of what is called the third book of the psalms. The Sata is, is divided into five books. He also wrote another psalm, Psalm 50, that we'll look at tonight for the sake of completeness. Now Asaph was a Levite. He was leader of David's choir and skilled in music. But as I said, he was also inspired by God to write scripture. We're told in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 30, that when the reformation of temple worship took place, the king then, King Hezekiah, ordered the Levites to praise the Lord. And it says, with the words of David, and Asaph, the prophet. So God is speaking to us through the words of Asaph, the great musician. So let's read together. And I'll read it. Let me follow along. And by the way, we will be looking quite closely at the text. So if you haven't got a Bible, do put up your hand um, and we'll pass one to you. Or if you've got it on your phone, that will be fine as well. Psalm 50. Psalm of Asaph, the mighty one, God the Lord speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire. Around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. Salah. And pause. Hear, O oh my people, and I will speak. O oh Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. 
Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you're pleased with him. And you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Amen. Thank him for his precious word that we'll look at a little bit later. I'm very conscious of God, of our own failures and sins. We do feel all the, the gentle rebuke of the Holy Spirit, pointing out these things in our minds and hearts, even as we come to worship you tonight. Our only plea is that the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world, was also shed for me, for us. And Lord, we thank you for that reminder this morning that Abraham saw your day, Lord Jesus, and rejoiced in it and put his faith in the one who was to come, that lamb provided by Jehovah Jireh. We look back, we're able to see the fulfillment of all your wonderful plan of redemption. So we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to go to Calvary. You did not spare your only son, Father, laid our sins upon him, so that we could be free, so that we could know you and rejoice in a relationship with you and know that we have a, a city that is in the heavens and will one day come down from heaven on the renewed earth, we'll dwell with you in glory and holiness, there'll be no more tears, no more suffering, no more sin and no more death. How oh, wonderful that is, and we give you our thanks and our praise. Oh God, we thank you that you have invited us to come and bring our request to you. We pray for our daily bread even. We thank you that you've given to us our daily food, even, even animals to eat, and grass and wheat to make bread, and fruit to enjoy. We pray that we would be those that look after the good things that you've given to us and we would be generous with all that you've given to us. Pray that we'd not be anxious. Remember that as you care even for the little sparrows, that it was only a penny, not even a penny. 
yet uh, you care for us much, much more. Because we're made in your image and redeemed by your son. Very thankful today, Lord, that we live in a country where we still have free speech and we're able to say what we believe in word and in print. And we pray that that would continue to be the case. That evil men and women would not want to stop the proclaiming of your word and the meeting of your people. So we're very thankful that we have this place in which to meet. Very thankful that we can go into all the world and preach the good news. We pray then for courage this week to do that wherever we are. Be with us in our work. Help us to do our best to be good employees and employers and colleagues and fathers and mothers and grandparents and children and grandchildren. Lord, if we name the name of Christ, we pray that we would not bring any dishonor to your name. Lord. As a church as well, we pray that you grant to us opportunities to reach out into Odeby all the town and the district roundabout. We want people here in this part of Britain to hear the good news. Guide us and lead us, we pray. We pray also that your word would go into all the world. And thank you for that reminder again this morning that um, Abraham was the father of many nations that Jesus, our Savior, would save. And, we think of the nation tonight, again, of, of Greece, in particular roads. We pray for any of your people that are, are stuck there or worried there, frightened. We pray that you'd watch over them, grant to them a, a dignified courage in all that's before us. So deliver that land. We, we pray from idolatry. Pray that you turn the hearts of very religious people, some of them, to the true living God and bring right sacrifices unto him. I think again, Lord, of Ukraine. Uh, our hearts do, uh, do mourn for them in all their losses and all their strife. Please bring peace in that land. Pray that you be with all the politicians that discuss these things. That there will be a just and a righteous settlement and peace in that land so that the gospel might have free course, be glorified even in that place. Oh Lord, with all these burdens upon our hearts, we thank you that we can cast them upon you knowing that you care for us. So Lord, hear the prayers of your people, those that are unuttered, those that are just silently breathed out to you. We know that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or even think. We ask all these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Please turn with me then to Psalm 50. You know uh, that uh, last week I was in court, not for anything I'd done. Um, I was in the courtroom itself for only about 10 minutes or so. Um, the charge was serious. The defendant uh, pleaded not guilty. And there was a certain sense of dignity and decorum, but something surprised me while I was in that court for a little while. Uh, there was quite a bit of uncertainty. Some of the court recorders and readers were quite hesitant. And most surprisingly, the, ch the, the judge was quite jokey. <laughs> he was trying to make everybody feel relaxed, I supposed, but 
I didn't have any idea whether the guy would be convicted. In fact, everything was translated. He didn't uh, speak English as his first language. And I don't know the outcome because I was not one of the 12 who were chosen um, out of the 16 that were initially led in. Um, it was a very interesting experience. And I thought how different that was to the picture Asaph paints for us in Psalm 50. For there is a court assembled with God as the judge. And there's nothing to joke about. There's no uncertainty about the outcome. So this evening I want us to survey the court, first of all, then hear the charges, secondly, and then thirdly, see if there is a conviction or not. We spend most of the time on the first and the second and briefly on the third. So let's, first of all, survey the court. And firstly, all eyes, rightly, are on the judge, as my eyes were when I went into that court in Leicester. My eyes were transfixed by the judge. And he begins the proceedings in verse 1. He's called the Mighty One. Mighty One God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. So that's a picture of God judging the whole earth, and though the whole earth is actually under God's judgment now, one day there'll be a final judgment of every human being who's ever lived. Every single one of us will be summoned to stand before God and give an account of our lives so that we can be judged according to what we've said and done. We know that he is a, a mighty judge. Nobody will be able to escape his judgment or fight against it or complain about it. Verse 3 tells us that when he speaks, his judgments will be like a holy fire that consumes everything in its path or like a mighty tempest that blows things away. It's not a wild fire out of control like in robes this week. It's a holy fire that is against all evil. It's not a whirlwind out of control. It's channeled against sin. And there's a perfection about God's judgments. Verse 2, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. So God won't make any mistakes in his judgments. He knows all things. He won't be missing any evidence. He won't need things to be translated for him. You know, when Abraham was wondering about whether or not God should destroy the people of Sodom and Gomorrah in case there were a few righteous people there, he says in Genesis 15, far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fare as the wicked, far be that from you shall not the judge of all the earth do right, and he will. We turn from the judge to the people in the dock. It's quite a surprise, isn't it? Because God's people are in the dock, verse 4 and 5. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Now we think that this was written, the psalm, in the context of the people of Israel coming together to renew their covenant uh, before God. Um, so this is more likely to refer to God's summons to us now, not to the final judgment. You know, God had made them his faithful ones through their faith in him and he will be faithful to them but would they be faithful to him and it's because god is committed to us that we do have to be continually called to account we need to be made ready for heaven we need to be 
growing in our holiness. And he summons us. He gathers his people so that we can examine ourselves and renew our commitment to him. The whole point of these court proceedings is that justice must be seen to be done. Verse 6. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge, but it must be seen to be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we often pray, don't we? Uh, we call a judge often your honour. So God's honour and glory, God's reputation is at stake. And so he says in verse 7, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am your God. If justice is going to be on display and vindicated, then God's holiness and righteousness needs to be seen in his people. Now you might be saying, well, well that's a very Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Doesn't, doesn't that mean that we're, we're not subject to any judgment. Well, actually, Peter makes a very similar argument in his first letter, chapter 4. It's worth turning to if you have your Bible, Peter's first letter and chapter 4, verse 16. And he's writing to suffering people, suffering Christians. And Peter says, if any of you Christians suffer as a Christian, he argues that's, that's hard. But it's okay. It's for a reason. Peter says, let him glorify God in that name. And then Peter says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Don't you be in the dock in an earthly court for being unrighteous. That would bring dishonor to God. For he has forgiven you. He has changed you. He has sanctified you. His justice has been satisfied because Christ suffered for your sins in your place. You are God's faithful ones, my people. But here's the question Peter poses. Is how you are living compatible with being a child of God? That's why Peter says, verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if he begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Verse, verse 18. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, that's us, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So his argument is people are watching you to see if God is a righteous judge to see if he's a merciful judge. I am your God. I always will be. But if you're not being my faithful ones, I've got to call you out about it. And if you don't change, sometimes I'll need to discipline you. In love. And that's what's happening in the court. Secondly, let's think about the charges in particular. And the two main areas I want to highlight, and this is the first, the charges that we often try to promote ourselves to God or before God. The people of God were returning to their default position of trying to justify themselves before God. They were bringing animal sacrifices and sort of saying, well, God, I'm bringing this sacrifice, it's very expensive, in order to make you think the best of me. That's awful, isn't it? It's almost like trying to sway a judge or bribe him to let you off. I'm going to give you all this money to charity, and to give this money to charity, and I hope you'll take that into consideration when you make your judgments. Oh, it, it's not that there was anything wrong in bringing sacrifices, at least for the Old Testament people of God. God had commanded them to do that, hadn't he? Verse 6, 
um, of verse 8, sorry, not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me, but they were meant to be a continual sign that God himself would one day provide a sacrifice for sin. One day the, the Lamb of God, as we were hearing this morning, would take away the sins of the world. And in verse 9 through to verse 13, he points out that he didn't need their animals, actually. They belong to him anyway. I will not accept a bull from your house, it says, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. That's beating them. That's preposterous. God is spirit. God is never hungry. No, no, what God wanted was their thankful praise. And their righteous obedience, verse 14, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. I'll come back to that. But the point is, it is God who should be the focus and not us. A writer called, a preacher as well, called Philip Yancey, highlights this kind of absorption with ourselves even in worship. He references Sodom Kierkegaard, who warns us about how we sometimes think of church as a kind of theatre. We sit in the audience, attentively watching the actors on stage. I suppose the preachers, really, although I'm not acting. And if sufficiently entertained, we show our gratitude with applause. And it's all about us. And then we'll be tired if the preacher goes on too long. But you see, God should be center stage. He is the one we should listen to. He is audience for our worship. God is not so concerned with what goes on externally on stage, but what takes place within our hearts. And Yancey says this, we should leave a worship service asking ourselves not what did I get out of it? But rather, was God pleased with what happened? So we need to ask ourselves, would God be pleased with what's been going on in our hearts today in our sacrifice of worship? And then in verse 15, uh, we see another aspect of self-promotion, and that is our self-sufficiency. And he draws attention to something that apparently the people of Israel were not doing. Verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. And again, it seems they thought that by bringing their animal sacrifices, God would get them out of trouble. No, that didn't glorify God because it emphasized what they can do, that, that I deserve to be helped and heard and delivered because of my offering. No, it's as if God is saying here, it will glorify me if I'm known as a God who helps the helpless, and known as the one who helps those who acknowledge their helplessness. I love the way uh, Charles Spurgeon illustrates this. I mean, he was preaching on Psalm 50, verse 15, and he did so a number of times, actually, so it shows it was important to him. Well, he preached a sermon in 1876, and the sermon title was Robinson Crusoe's Text. And he explains how Robinson Crusoe was the guy who had been shipwrecked. He's left on the desert island all alone to... Fem for himself, his case is a very, sympath very pathetic one, and he goes to his bed, and he's struck with fever, and Crusoe's fever lasts for a long time, and there's no one to wait on him, no man Friday at that time, nobody even to bring him a cup of cold water, and he's ready to perish. I mean, he'd been accustomed to a sinful life, he had the vices of a sailor, says Spurgeon, but his hard case brought him to think. And he opens a Bible, which he finds in his chest. 
and he lights upon this verse. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. And you shall glorify me. And apparently that night he prayed for the first time in his life and ever after that. And there was in him a hope in God which marked the birth of his heavenly life. Isn't that lovely? Now imagine if Crusoe had said, right, it's up to me to get myself out of this mess. I'm an ingenious bloke. I'll get myself out of here and I'll become a celebrity. No, no. We need constantly to be telling ourselves, I can do nothing without Christ. That's what Jesus said. Without me, you can do nothing. So call upon me in the day of trouble. And that's what they were not doing. I thought we're doing that. It's all part of trying to promote ourselves before God. And the second challenge that the psalmist makes to the people of God is this. It's trying to hide our lives from God. It's almost the opposite, isn't it? First of all, trying to promote ourselves. But also we try to hide our lives from God. And the charge here is hypocrisy, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I think many people in the world today, especially young people, regard this as one of the greatest sins in the world, to, to live a lie, to be hypocritical. It's only if other people are lying and being hypocritical, not them. It's only other people. And in verse 16, God described his people who live a lie as wicked. That's what I found shocking. They recite God's statutes, God's law, are quite willing to repeat the words of a covenant, agreeing to walk with God, but they're false promises. Why are they false promises? Verse 17 tells us, for you hate discipline. You cast my words behind you. In other words, as soon as something challenging happens to our lives, we think it's okay to forget our vows and do what's easy and not what's godly. And there are specific charges that God demands the people answer. Briefly look at them, verse 18. If you see a thief, you're pleased with him. So this is turning a blind eye to theft, even being complicit maybe handling stolen goods, maybe asking for a cash in hand price. And he says you keep company with adulterers. Of course, that's not saying that adulterers can't be forgiven. Of course they can. They can be saved as well. And I think James, in his letter, expands what this means, actually. James 4, verse 4, he says to Christians, again, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And the psalmist is saying, don't you think God can see all that? Why are you trying to hide? your life from him. And they somehow think that God doesn't hear what they say. But of course, God knows what we think. Verse 19, you give your mouth free reign for evil. You, your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. And maybe the worst thing what lies behind all their wickedness is bringing God down to our level, thinking that God is just like us. Verse 21. These things you have done and I have been silent. You thought I was one like yourself. In other words, uh, that uh, somehow God is turning a blind eye to what he sees. But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. We know this, don't we? We keep telling ourselves this. The Lord knows our hearts. Jesus said the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. These make a man unclean for out of the heart and evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. 
when our lives do not match up to our profession. I'm not talking now about occasionally sinning, which we do. We confess our sins. I'm talking about habitually not walking the walk, not showing people that we are God's people. It's a sign that we've forgotten God, forgotten our vows to live for his glory. Somebody said um, there is a long interval between the lightning flash and the thunder peal. So Paul says, let the one who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. You see, this is, this is God graciously giving us a, a warning. It's, it's the lightning flash before the thunder peal. So there we are. The, we've seen the court. We've seen the charges. And then thirdly, the conviction, because after all we've heard, what is the verdict? It's obviously guilty. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous. No, not one. God's words here have convicted all mankind. We've heard the thunder, and thunder is a sure sign that a storm is coming. So what's the answer? How can we shelter from the storm of God's judgment? Well, we've seen that it's not by trying to hide our lies and our faults from God. It's not trying to promote ourselves before God by offering animal sacrifices as if, as if we can twist God's arm. Now, the answer is in verse 23. The one who offers thanks.